Hey, Kim, fam. Caitlin Binder here, getting ready for lecture 12. We're going to start you off with some nice calming breaths and some, some nice little scenery greenery. Get yourself ready in a nice, comfortable seat, taking some nice, releasing breaths. Take a look at this wonderful aquatic scenery that is not in focus. If you look carefully and squint, you might be able to see some ghost shrimp, little shrimpies. Get your notes out. Lecture 12, stretch out those hands and get ready for some knowledge. Well, we're about to get started here with the lecture 12 content. I recommend watching this at your own pace before our next lecture. Um, the idea is the next lecture is going to be uh, maybe like the first 20 or so minutes of a review and then the remainder of it is just open office hours. We can talk about this content, um, but we will have, there is a Canvas assignment where you submit your completed notes, so these lecture 12 templates to Canvas for credit instead of iClick or Reef. So I'm going to try this out. Let me know what you think. I'm just going to change the format so it's just the screen and you don't need to see my face, although I'm loving beachy hair, sandy hair, did my cold plunge this morning, so I'm feeling good. Here we go. Lecture 12 is all about lipids, also known as fats. So let's talk about some fat. We're going to talk about general classification of these fats, uh, what I think is just the coolest pathway because it's a really nice way to review all the mechanisms that we've seen in this class or have been seeing in this class. And we're gonna take this up to the next level, talk about how isopentanyl diphosphate um, is a very common metabolic intermediate for making many different types of lipids. We're specifically gonna talk about the terpeno terpenoids. Uh, if you remember, particularly those that you have taken 8L, um, terpenes and terpenoids is a larger class of um, compounds that are uh, typically in multiples of five carbons. And the most common examples of these terpenoids would be something like uh, citrus oil or just other essential oils. Or in other words, they're made from plants. Uh, from plants. Okay. Great, so here we go. General classification, uh, three types of compounds we'll be talking about, fatty acids, triacylglycerols, and terpenes. You should be able to identify or construct those given the components. So first we have uh, fatty acids being made into triglycerols. Uh, fatty acids have anywhere in this carbon tail from like 12 uh, to 20 or maybe even more Carbon. So we just have uh, that squiggle there that just means there's, there's a lot of carbon. So this, we call this the fatty tail, uh, where this is the uh, nonpolar side, the fatty part right here. And then on the left, we have our polar side, our carboxylic acid. In order for us to make fatty acids, literally, we make it in our bodies, into triacylglycerols, we need to make this OH group into a much better leaving group, and we do this through ATP act activation. So we've, so we've seen this also in glycolysis, a simpler thing where, uh, again, this is going to be a much better leaving group. This is basically nature's leaving group. But by putting in one mole of ATP for every mole of fatty acid, uh, we get this acyl phosphate. And I realize this just had three ATPs and three ADPs are used. And again, we call this an acyl phosphate functional group. Really nice leaving group. And this is a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction. We know that because we started with one carbonyl and we ended with a different carbonyl. Uh, the other thing that we lose in this process is nothing, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I do want to highlight this oxygen is the same one as this one. So we didn't actually lose water, which is what I was about to say. So this alcohol or the OH group attacks ATP and we lose our adenosyl diphosphate. So we have our really nice activated guy here. We have three of those. And in terms of making a triacylglycerol when, uh, when fats are made, this could be three of the same, or it could be three different. A little more common for them to be different, 
three different chains, uh, it's, it's just not uniform. So we might have three different carbon chains and some of them may have double bonds. We would say some are unsaturated. Right, it's meaning they have some that are double bonds and then the saturated ones would be the ones that are um, all single bonds. We mix these together. We have three esterification reactions. So each one of these alcohol groups will attack, and I'm just, this is the totally abbreviated mechanism. This is not the full mechanism at all, but just to give you the general idea, uh, these electrons kick to the carbonyl carbon, kick these electrons up to oxygen. In the separate intermediate, the electrons kick down and kick out phosphate. So this is just, please don't write the mechanisms like this on your own, but we've seen enough of these uh, nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanisms. Um, and I'm hoping it'll be enough to just uh, put that here since our focus is going to be on other things today. Um, so this would be three of them. We would have three nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions to give us a triacylglycerol. These triacylglycerols are commonly written like this, sort of like a Fischer projection, where each of these three oxygens came from the initial glycerol molecule, and they will have attachments of different fatty acid tails. Okay, so again, some of these, if they're all carbon-carbon single bonds, we would call this uh, a saturated fatty acid. Other ones will have double bonds. I'll just like throw in one example there. So you might have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and maybe a little double bond there. This is just a little sketch, but if we have one double bond, it's very commonly, if not always, Z or cis. This is the opposite of trans, and you may have heard trans fats are bad for you, but really it's just that they're non-natural. Those tend to be processed fats. So these are the ones that are natural. These are our unsaturated fats. where you have one or more carbon-carbon double bonds, and they do tend to be Z. The cis fats are the natural ones. These are the ones that we can actually break down, whereas those trans fats are a little bit tougher for our bodies to deal with. So that's a general example without getting into too much detail, but this would be a great thing for you to practice on your own. And remember, um, since this is not gonna be a live lecture, this would be a great thing to practice on your own and then we can talk about it in office hours of how to actually break it down. Um, because remember this abbreviated mechanism is not okay uh, for you to draw, I'm gonna say for exams, but I wanted to spend my time on other stuff today because we uh, have seen these nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanisms, but the other ones are gonna be new. Okay, so that's uh, making a triacylglycerol, three ester groups connected to a glycerol molecule which has three carbons. Moving on to the next class of compounds, um, terpenes and terpenoids. Uh, the terpenoids is the larger family that includes terpenes. The terpenes by definition are all hydrocarbons. So there's carbons and um, carbons and hydrogens only. Um, so it, right down here, these guys would be proper terpenes, beta pinene and limonene. Beta pinene holds a special place in my heart. This is what my doctoral dissertation started with. This is my starting material for making a catalyst that did some asymmetric chemistry. So this is my favorite. I'm gonna just. Make this in. This is my favorite molecule because it opened up a lot of doors for me. Good times. Uh, and then limonene uh, is the natural uh, essential oil and citrus. Carbone is present in, in many things, spearmint and caraway oil being two of them. 
then menthol is also found. Actually, spearmint or peppermint, I'm just going to write mint. <laughs> I forget, I don't know if it matters, but so these are some other examples of, uh, again, the broader family of monoterpenoids. This larger family includes terpenes, but it also would include, uh, the terpenoids would include oxygen. So it includes terpenes and oxygen-containing compounds. Right. So what we have here is just the, the, the building blocks. Uh, this is the isopropene unit isoprene unit, it's a five carbon building block, so that's what these two have in common. Uh, this is the real metabolic intermediate. Notice we have this super nice leaving group. Metabolic intermediate here, and we have this OPP, which is a diphosphate, also known as pyrophosphate. It's inorganic, so there's no carbon. It's going to be abbreviated with the P's and the circles around them. Uh, so that OPP is really an abbreviation for a diphosphate or a pyrophosphate. So this is just giving you a little heads up of why we're talking about terpenes. Um, they're important, they're made by plants and they smell nice. Let's take a look at how they're made. This page is super, super cool. I actually would highly recommend that you uh, try this page before I go through it and try this page after I go after it. So uh, we have some, um, some hints along the page. I'll just draw your attention to, to the hints that are on there. Um, not even really hints necessarily, but just reminding you of the different reactions. So this is not a mechanisms page. This is a, a reaction page. And we can see lots of different examples of reactions that should be familiar. Claisen, aldol, hydrolysis, reduction. ATP stuff, more ATP stuff, hey, other ATP stuff, and check it out, decarboxylation. So I'd recommend pausing and trying it out. Otherwise, I'm just gonna get things going. All right, in this, the first step, we're gonna make our four carbon piece. And, and again, I wanna remind you what we're doing. We're starting from acetyl-CoA, which was one of the end products of glycolysis, um, in a sense. Ooh, so it went, I'll be a little more clear about that. It went glycolysis made pyruvate, and then there was a decarboxylation to make acetyl-CoA. So that's just connecting what we saw in lecture 11. So acetyl-CoA is a two carbon unit. We link two of them together with a coenzyme A leaving group. They're identical, so it doesn't really matter which one of them you have leaving, but what is important is that you know um, that these two are gonna come together. All right, great. And I realized I have some redundancies here. Um, I have, let's see, yeah, I have this twice and I shouldn't, so this should be gone. So I showed that this is the, this is the leaving group. So I had to pause because I got a little confused. In a Claisen condensation, we make a new carbon-carbon bond. So let's just say one of these hydrogens would be removed by a base. It would attack the carbonyl carbon, and we would lose the S-CoA as a leaving group. So if that were the case, I'm going to move to this guy. So again, this is the abbreviated form. We want you to do this in the long form, but the idea is these electrons would come in, attack carbonyl carbon, electrons kick up to oxygen, you get that intermediate. Electrons kick back down, kick to a proton, and this is how we end up with two carbonyls in the product. And say this is that first carbonyl here that reformed, and then the second carbonyl, we'll just not shade that in. So that's our Claisen product, and I'm going to remind you that it's not okay to do what I just did here on the exam. You want to show this in two steps. So there should be an intermediate. Okay, I wanted the goal here to actually just show um, the product. So that's reminding us of a Claisen condensation. In step 2a, we have another molecule of acetyl-CoA coming in. So I'll add in this guy here. Beep, beep, so cute. So acetyl-CoA, this is going to be an aldol-like reaction. And it's only aldol-like because it's not 
strictly reacting with aldehydes, but it is an aldol-like reaction here because we're going to be forming a new carbon, carbon bond. So from here, we have this guy losing a proton. This one we actually can do in one step. We would have the base pick up proton, two electrons attack the ketone. The ketones are more reactive. They're more electropositive. Those electrons would kick straight up to another proton. I'm keeping this simple with B's and H's, but you can always uh, take this up to the next level by using amino acid residues, right? So you might want to pause and draw that intermediate before uh, you join me. I'm going to keep the same stuff in blue. We have this S-CoA group. This is now going to be an alcohol. Now here, I've created a puzzle, uh, meaning you, you do need to look a little bit forward to make some sense of this. So there's some stereochemistry that's formed here that you would really only know if you were given the name of the enzyme or given the names of the products. So we're just going to use that, um, again, as part of this puzzle, sort of like a, like a crossword in a, in a way, because we, we we're using some um, other filled in information to show us that this OH group should be pointing back and this methyl group pointing forward. All right, so then the new stuff comes in, and I'm gonna make this purple. Um, the new bond was between that carbon right here. Oops, nope. This carbon right here, which was that guy. The line that I already drew, that's the new bond. This was the alpha carbon, so I'm just gonna put dots there. Do, do, carbonyl stayed as is, that purple carbonyl, nothing happened to it. And we have a little coenzyme A action. So again, working ourselves forward to see that it's an aldol reaction forming a new carbon-carbon bond. But this product here really let us know that yes, we should have this, uh, this sequence or this chain of these one, two, three, I think it's five carbons here in this chain. So that could be a nice hint uh, of, of how things are put together. Next would be the hydrolysis reaction. This is another great mechanism to try on your own, but remember that in a hydrolysis reaction, we are gonna start with one type of carbonyl. In this case, it's a thioester. We add water, perform that hydrolysis, and that thioester is exchanged for an oxygen. So here we're making a carboxylic acid or more properly called a carboxylate when it's deprotonated. All right, and remember, um, carboxylic acids should never have their hydrogens under physiological conditions. This is all done in a plant. Uh, this is all pH 7.4. So we keep that in mind for all of our charges. So carboxylic acids should always be negative or carboxylates, whereas alcohols should always be neutral with their hydrogens. Good stuff. From here, we have a thioester reduction. So you would need to be told that, right? We have two different carbonyls. If I were to just say, ah, hey, look, we have um, NADPH, which is equivalent to NADH. This is the same thing as just having some H minuses, some hydrides. And you can say that after me. Hydride, it's a hydride, hydrogen with its electrons. Again, this is specifically going to reduce the high, or sorry, the thioester all the way down. So we need to identify what the thioester actually is. This is where advanced functional group stuff comes into play. And we reduce it twice. It's gonna be knocked down two levels. And I always find these little things as I'm working through, but in this step, we should also be losing um, that S-CoA group. All right, so that's going to be a leaving group. And another hint for that is to see down below, I mean, after a few steps, we see that S-CoA is no longer there. So those are other uh, hints moving forward, and that's why I like this page. From here, okay, we're going to have all the same stuff. The carboxylate should be exactly the same. Let's see if I can keep my color coding going. So you can tell the difference between this blue stuff here. I'm actually going to here, I'm going to be... Uh, kind of nitpicky about this. I'm gonna make this bond green because that was the newly formed, the last newly formed bond. All right, add in this other stuff. All this other stuff has not changed. I'll shade in this oxygen, just keeping track, pause as much as you need to. And now the difference, this carbon that was very highly oxidized is now 
pretty much as reduced as you can get it uh, under physiological conditions. So it's going to reduce it all the way down um, to the alcohol. So we have a primary alcohol. And it's good to have this designation because check it out on this next step. ATP is specifically going to react with the primary alcohol. So we'll have a phosphorylation reaction. Everything else will be the same. Put this guy over here, kind of clean this up a little bit. And at this stage, we're going to start using this P circle designation, P circle. Um, and that means it's a phosphate group. Okay, so this would be a uh, PO3. I know that phosphate itself is um, not usually a PO3, it's actually a PO4, but we already have one of the oxygens in there. So just kind of keeping, keeping that in mind. Moving right along. Um, and actually, you know what, instead of calling it a phosphate, just to be, just to be very clear, because I like to do that, um, that this is technically, it's not a phosphate anymore, it's a phosphoester. Let's be very clear about that. We can uh, lightly call it a phosphate group, but technically it's a phosphoester. So we have that one. And then in the second step here, we have another reaction with the primary phosphate. That's the primary phosphate. And hey, I should correct myself. Binder, what are you doing? This is a primary phosphoester. Get it together. We're going to have all the same stuff here. Boop, doop. Boom, boom. Now it's just going to be two groups. This is called a phosphodiester. Right. We have another phosphorylation reaction. And in each one of these, by the way, we are losing a mole of ATP. Not ASP, that's aspirin. I'm confusing it with my chem and M class. Each time we lose that ADP, right? And this time, again, we're using our, our knowledge of classifications. ATP reacts with a tertiary alcohol, this one. We have this phosphorylation reaction. I'm going to circle these guys so we know it's not just like a regular uh, phosphorus ion. It's just hard to show in my drawing structure. Last one is a nice way to practice your decarboxylation mechanisms that we saw in lecture 11 to show how the CO2 molecule leaves. So this carbon here came from the only carbon that's connected to two oxygens. I'm using some nice uh, designations there or some nice uh, simple, simple logic of how we know which carbon is which. In order to get that reaction to make sense, we start from electron rich and we go to what's going to be electron poor, which seems a little weird because I know it's negatively charged. So maybe instead of calling it the electron poor thing, let's call it the leaving group because we know that's where the arrows should end. So arrows should always start at the electron rich zone and the arrows should end at the leaving group. We'll take the electrons from that oxygen, kick them down to make that carbon oxygen double bond. So it could be helpful to remind yourself that carbon dioxide has two double bonds. In decarboxylation, the biggest thing is that we're breaking a carbon carbon bond. That happens right here with that arrow. And then this bond breaks, the carbon oxygen bond breaks, and we lose our phosphate group. So hopefully that's easy enough to see that, that arrow, but that's uh, our decarboxylation mechanism. So as an overview, Things. One second. Here is this beautiful mevalonate pathway to IPP. And this IPP, as an overview or big picture, is a basic building block for all terpenoids. Plant stuff. Notice that it has five carbons. That's your five carbon building block. We've introduced three sources of carbon. They were all the same, but three moles of acetyl-CoA, so that should be six, but then in the last step we broke off one of them. And that's your basic building block for lots of different terpenoids. So let's use it. Here we see an overview of this process of how we link together two, excuse me, two five carbon, five carbon building blocks to make a 10 carbon building block, which is really where most of them start. Um, there's, I don't even know if there's any just like 
plain five carbon terpenes. Uh, we call these monoterpenes because those are the smallest we can get. So a monoterpene, if I can scroll back up here, um, all of these monoterpenes, uh, these are 10 carbon units. And that's as small as the terpenes get. So that's why they call them monoterpenes, even though it's two isoprene units together. So it's a terpene when it's 10. Okay, so we're not gonna use all of this. We're not gonna go through all of these, but I wanted to at least give you an idea of where we could go and then branch off and, and just show some examples. Uh, so we have two five carbon pieces coming together. Um, this is the one we made on the last page. There's an isomerization that occurs. So we actually have uh, two different five carbon building blocks that come together to make 10. And the, there's gonna be a general pattern that we'll see. Uh, first, we have an alkene addition reaction, uh, a nucleophilic addition from the alkene, and there's gonna be a carbocation formed. So when we go through these mechanisms below, and they'll be much more detailed, uh, we'll see lots of carbocation stuff. There may or may not be some carbocation rearrangements. We haven't seen these in this class yet, but this is like the key difference between terpene metabolism or a distinguishing feature of terpene metabolism. Um, some things that could be happening in carbocation rearrangements would be hydride or alkyl shifts. And something else that might happen, we might be making some new carbon-carbon bonds at this, at this phase. We could all, we're also gonna be making some new carbon-carbon bonds here. You'll see, you'll see, there's some cool stuff that happens. So there's some like rearrangement-y type stuff. And then in that third step, we have an E1-like elimination to restore the alkene. Or reform the alkene. So if you don't remember what an E1 is, you can go back to your, I believe it was lecture three notes, or you can just wait and see <laughs> what that one was all about. Um, but again, we open that alkene, have those electrons not shared between two, but they're gonna be polarized to form one carbocation on one of those carbons, and then an alkene reforms. That's the general idea. And we do have some loss of these phosphate groups. So notice here, we started with two, diphosphate groups, we lose one of them, and each compound is just gonna have um, that one diphosphate group. So let's take a look. First, we're going to um, isomerize, actually, maybe we should do this first, to isomerize IPP into DMAP. So I'll show that up here. Uh, to isomerize uh, this, we have to keep track of what's different. That's uh, gonna be the position of that hydrogen. And we can show this, having a base. And this is all within an enzyme active site. I'm keeping it with Bs and Hs for simplicity. B attacks H. These two, I'm gonna zoom. These two electrons come down to make that double bond. And then these two electrons come out and pick up a separate proton. So that's how this isomerization reaction happens. I'm just gonna say it's, it isomerizes, okay to make some DMAP. Okay, so you're welcome to pause and kind of think about that. I'm gonna move down below. Beep, 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 beep. Okay, so first we have DMAP lose a phosphate group. It's a diphosphate, so we'll just leave them as OPP. I hope you're cool with this. We're friends now. We understand that they're not just naked phosphori. We have a primary carbocation, which hopefully makes you or gives you some feelings, uh, but it's not just primary, it's also allylic. They're very likely resonance structures where these electrons move over to make it a tertiary carbocation. But the important thing to keep in mind for uh, metabolism is it's not, it's not about what's the most stable, it's about what the enzyme is going to make. The enzyme has made the decision that this reaction is going to happen between the primary carbon of what was DMAP and the primary carbon of IPP. So just to be clear, some IPP isomerizes into DMAP, some IPP stays as IPP. Okay, so these are your two fragments we're gonna bring in and I'll highlight them, I like doing this. So here's the first one, hopefully it's still readable. I'll make this other one a little bit lighter. So this is a separate five carbon piece 
these two will come together, this is your alkene addition. I call this a nucleophilic addition. The double bond simply attacks that primary carbocation. Okay, so this is a nucleophilic addition. Let's have this pink chain here. Double bonds still there. Go draw a little dot. I'm going to make this a green line. That's the new bond. We have uh, some geometry to do here and make sure we don't lose any carbons to have. Okay, there we go. This is the one that has the methyl group. And since this carbon here has the new bond, it has those bonding electrons that's shared between the new carbon carbon bond. And the carbon that's left over, this tertiary one, will be left with the carbocation, which hopefully makes you feel a little bit better because more substituted carbocations are more stable. All right, so again, we'll just label this as our tertiary carbocation. And we'll write a little smiley face. Yay, we're very happy with tertiary carbocations. This will then close, or rather to, to reform the double bond, and I actually want to make space. I should have put this guy up here. This is following that pattern that I had above where we uh, open up. We have an alkene addition. We don't see a carbocation rearrangement in this one, but this second step is going to be uh, the E1-like elimination to restore or reform the alkene. And part of this, remember this is still like puzzle stuff. I don't expect you to remember all of these steps, but if I give you this scaffold and you know, hey, GPP is the next step, we know we need to form this double bond. So I'll highlight, I think I lost some of my highlighting skills, but that is from there. These guys are from there. These guys are from here and there. And there's already enough highlighted, so I'll just circle uh, that double bond needs to be new. The main thing, and I've already highlighted this hydrogen, is that a base is required. This is just a base in the enzyme active site, like a aspartate residue, for example. This is the E1 style elimination. Style, elimination. And it's E1 style because there's a carbocation. We're reforming the, car, uh, the alkene. This is going to continue on um, or not, <laughs> and then the metabolism does a lot of different things. So uh, GPP could go on to make some other terpenes itself. Uh, it could go on to make cannabinoids if we're talking about uh, cannabis. So those are just some options. And just to give you an idea of how this could be, you know, can, you could basically continue this on and on. We're going to see the same cycle of reactions to make farnesyl diphosphate, which is the 15 carbon version. We then link them together to make 30 carbon versions. And this is where we start to get as big as steroids. That's just not we're gonna, what we're going to talk about here today. So this is just to give you an idea of how we add on those five carbon building blocks. So let's review this uh, again. We have, I'm going to just go back to black. Boop, 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 boop. Meh, 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 meh. Meh. Pause for a second to make sure I'm not forgetting anyone. It'll be helpful to color stuff. You always, numbering is great too, but I'm just going to color in those five carbons in purple and color in these five carbons. So I make sure I have five, which is great. And I have a new primary allylic carbocation, which is now going to be an excellent electrophile. We'll have another nucleophilic addition, same exact idea as what we saw up here. Nucleophilic addition from IPP's alkene to that carbocation that makes the new carbon-carbon bond. I'll highlight stuff to make sense of what's where. There's your first five. There's your second five. Let's get a new color, like this green, for these next five carbons, including that diphosphate group, because this carbons or the alkenes pi electrons were shared with the carbocation, there is still a leftover now tertiary carbocation. Again, the same pattern as what we saw up here. Okay, so we're going to hear it again at a tertiary carbocation. This will be useful for another round of E1 style elimination. 
there's this hydrogen that needs to be removed so we can make this final alkene. A base is responsible for that. A base pulls off hydrogen, kicks those electrons down, and we've made FPP. You down with FPP? Yeah, you know me. You down with FPP? Every last told me. You down with FPP? Yeah, you know me. And do, 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 just coloring stuff in to keep track. And of course, numbering your carbons is always super cool, but this is just a little more uh, festive. And it also really helps you see which are the newly formed bonds in this process. So this guy that's not really colored in um, was a newly formed bond, and so was that one. So this is how um, plants make carbon-carbon bonds to make their essential oils, and that way the bees and the birds know to eat them and to help them reproduce. Hooray! Back things up a little bit, uh, give one example of how GPP could be made into terpenes, specifically limonene, and that's uh, what we see in citrus oil. So this could have, in, in this case, we're going to close the ring. I have the first set of arrows here to get us set up, and I'm gonna have, I have a strategic way of drawing the product, and I always welcome you to do this to kind of work your way backwards. This is just a nice way of drawing it zigzag style. But if you were to draw the actual product or the intermediate, I guess, we want to draw it so that we're set up for the next step. So all this stuff in blue is the stuff that hasn't changed. These two carbons, I'll just give them dots. So the numbers are here and here. And the difference should be that there's a double bond in between those last two carbons. We've lost our phosphate group. And this is also abbreviated as PPI, as in inorganic pyrophosphate. There's no carbons there. I'm missing something. Oh, I'm missing fully a carbocation. That carbon, that tertiary one, lost electrons, didn't get any back. So hopefully we're seeing a little bit of a trend, lots of carbocation stuff. Um, in terms of uh, getting the ring closing to happen, we can do this in one step. I would document here that this is a double bond. Now it's single and there is a new carbocation. So this must be the electron rich region or at least where the arrows start. The other thing I'd know is that that's a new bond. So we need to form a new bond here. We'll have the pi electrons reach out and attack here, kicking these electrons up. Because another thing you'll note is that that's now a double bond. Yeah, and this is a single bond. So this is our intermediate just before we reclose or uh, reform that alkene in another E1 style elimination. There's a hydrogen here. That's all the difference. All the difference in the world. Base required to pull off that hydrogen and we reform that alkene. And this is how limonene is made. This is uh, uh, the main component in all citrus oils, particularly oranges. And if you know about uh, that stuff called Goo Gone, which is really nice for removing sticky materials, it's just limonene. That's its main component, if not its only component. So it's just a nice oil that dissolves sticky stuff. And it smells really nice. So that's uh, another example of what we could do with GPP. And now I'd like to show one example of what we could do with FPP. Right? So this is again the little branching point. If we go back here, uh, we saw some stuff that could happen with GPP, but then if we add on five more carbons, we can do some cool stuff with FPP. We're going to show the synthesis of a tobacco component. This will be our reintroduction into carbocation rearrangements, because I know we haven't dealt with these at all in class yet. So this would be a good opportunity to take some nice deep breaths, get yourself ready. I wish I had water in here with me. I don't, but uh, what are you going to do? Okay, so lots of, lots of fun stuff going on, uh, and I already have some, some pieces of the puzzle. So this is another one where I actually recommend you just try this on your own before you watch, or you can watch, up to you, good times. So in order to go from this strategically drawn FPP, and you can see strategically because we want to form a couple of six-membered rings. So it's usually like a straight chain is what we had before, but it's all rearranged or just uh, rotated rather. So no reaction has happened yet. It's, it's still the same molecule that we had on the previous page. In order to make this carbocation, all we need to do is just show that this leaving group will leave. This double bond should stay exactly where it was. We have pyrophosphate leaving group, PPI, inorganic phosphate, there's our abbreviation. 
And then we're given this instruction that we should be forming a new carbon-carbon bond with that arrow. And we can use the next intermediate that's drawn as a little hint. So we're forming a 10 membered ring, which sort of looks like two six membered rings side by side. So specifically, we'll be breaking that bond, breaking the pi bond, and making that 10 membered ring. So you basically just draw two six membered rings side by side with no central bond. And you should be drawing a really nice looking 10 membered ring. I'll draw everything else that should be the same. Now you have to forgive the bond angle right there. This is just the only way that you can really draw it. Uh, but certainly there's some three dimensionality to this. Um, this does not have like a 30 degree bond angle. This is just the best we can do. So please forgive that. Maybe you care, maybe you don't. Uh, this should be the same. This pi bond is still there. So I can do some highlighting to keep track. Right there, um, our new bond will be between some just dots between this guy and this guy. So I'll just do the little dots of where they were formed. Now in terms of, you know, which one is it uh, the carbon, uh, the red carbon on the left or the red carbon on the right, kind of hard to tell which one would be uh, the one making the new carbon carbon bond. And that's where we have to really look at uh, the future product. So we should have a little branching point right off of here. So it'll look just like what we see in that product or in the next intermediate. Now, remember that when we do that breakage of that carbon-carbon bond, we shared some electrons to make that new bond, which means that we have to have a carbocation present. So that's the main, there are two of the main differences and I'll make this green as well. So we can see that, hey, that's our uh, newly formed carbon-carbon bond. We have a similar pattern here where we're going from a single bond to a double bond. This is another E1 style elimination. We'll need a base to pull off a proton. Kick those electrons down, reform the alkene. Good stuff. This then is going to rearrange a whole bunch more. We'll finally start to see some of those hydride <laughs> rearrangements, some uh, uh, carbocation rearrangements. So we get you started by saying, okay, well, if this one reaches out and grab a pro grabs a proton, what are we likely to get? And that is going to be uh, a carbocation and a new, so a new hydrogen is gonna go to the less substituted and the carbocation goes to the more substituted. So I'll make this little note, is that we wanna see a more substituted, in this case, tertiary carbocation, that three prime is tertiary. Use a little studio magic here to just redraw all the stuff in the molecule that hasn't changed. I'll highlight some stuff so we can see what definitely has. So right now it's gonna be this double bond. It's now a single bond. We have a new hydrogen, which we don't always draw, but I'll go ahead and put it right there. That's our new hydrogen. And over here, this is our tertiary carbocation. I like making them different colors. Let's do pink. So this is a new hydrogen and that's the carbocation. Great. Now from here, oh man, some stuff has changed. Your trash. Uh, some stuff has changed. Um, I'm gonna do that highlighting again. So I think this is gonna be a really nice way to see what's different. So these two carbons are the purple guys. These two carbons are the um, blue ones. And nothing's changed over here on the red, but it just, makes things a little more fun to look at. So you can see nothing's changed over there. Uh, we're going to see what's different. And the main thing, the biggest thing that I hope you see that's different is that there's a new carbon-carbon bond. We have this bridge now in the middle. So we do see two six-membered rings side by side. So it's the purple and the blue is where the magic is happening. We start at the electron rich double bond, and this carbocation will be electron poor, double bond, goes to positive charge, and boom, we've made our new carbon-carbon bond while forming this tertiary carbocation intermediate. All right, so now we're set up, now for sure set up for uh, some super neat uh, carbocation rearrangements. So from here to here, it just looks like the carbocation moves, but that's not that's not really what's happening. So if we're being very technical, the carbocation is not the thing that moves.
So remember that a positive charge is an absence of electrons. Arrow pushing is all about movement of electrons. So what we really should be looking for is what electrons are moving. The best way to do this is to fill in, or what I like to call decoding structures. I'll fill in and highlight just this purple region for now, uh, because that's the only part that's changing. So it's not actually the carbocation that's moving. I, I know even it, it does look like that, um, but the real difference is the position of a hydrogen. Let me make sure I have this in the right spot. Yeah. Okay, so if we properly decode our structure, we see it's a hydrogen that moves. Specifically, it's a hydrogen with its electrons, also known as a hydride. Say it with me, hydride. <laughs> Negative charge along with the hydrogen will show one arrow that is going to both break and form that bond. So that's a very special one arrow. Um, and again, that arrow means that hydrogen moves and takes its electrons with it. So the hydrogen moves with its electrons. This means that we have a CH break and a different CH form. But we have to start at the bond. Starting it there means that bond breaks. Ending it here means this bond forms. That's a hydride shift. H minus or a hydride shift. Pause and appreciate. <laughs> okay, I'm going to highlight the rest of this molecule to keep track. Make it a little more aesthetically pleasing. We'll highlight those same carbons on the product so we can have a colorful discussion of what's actually changing. Right, so see if we can notice what's changing. The position of that hydrogen and the purple team is the same. Maybe it's helpful to you to see that. That dude's still there. The difference, which I hope you've seen or noticed, make some space, is the position of this methyl group. The methyl group just moved, y'all. It's crazy. Uh, and this happens. It really happens in all kinds of plants. We have the movement of the methyl group from one bond to the next. We show this by starting at the bond and ending at the carbocation. So we start at the CC bond and we end that arrow at the carbocation. And that means by starting at the carbon-carbon bond that it's breaking. And by ending at the carbon-carbon at the carbocation, we have a new bond that's forming. So again, this is the new bond that's formed. Because we lost electrons there on the blue carbon, it's now positively charged. So this is a great example of how to bring back up uh, alkyl shifts. Specifically, we would call this one a methyl shift. So the deal is, instead of a hydride shift, it's a CH3 with a negative charge is how we think of it. And this moves over one carbon. So the CC breaks, it moves over with its electrons. Nice exemplification of terpene metabolism. All that's left to do is to reform that alkene. Uh, Epi-aristolochene is, again, a tobacco component. And uh, yeah, there is some stereochemistry that happens. Each one of these additions, each time you form a chiral center within the enzyme, uh, the enzyme has specific 3D shape. And just for simplicity, I haven't shown it up until there. It doesn't like appear on this last step, uh, but I was just, you know, just wanted to show main carbon-carbon uh, bond breaking and formation. To close this out, Last example of our E1 style elimination. Proton here, base picks up that proton. I'm gonna choose a different color. I like my colors. Zoom in. These two electrons kick down to reform that double bond. And I'll highlight here so you can see um, beginning to end of what we started with and what we ended with. We've uh, made stable molecule, meaning there's no carbocation. And that's our lecture on lipids. Lots of different ways, uh, di different ways that we can think about this, uh, different ways that a five carbon building block could be incorporated. So as an overview, tobacco component, 
citrus oil, 10 carbons. And then what was the other one we saw? Oh yeah, that was it. I thought there was another one. Anyway, I have, I have lots of things going on in my head. So we have different things that these uh, isoprene units could be made into. And then the last thing that I wanted to bring up, I realized in these lecture notes, I just had a little inconsistency. Um, usually this is exam two material, um, but I decided to put or to wait to put lecture 12 on the next exam. So you can just read that little note there. Uh, thank you very much for joining this remote lecture. Don't, for, uh, don't forget to uh, submit your notes on Canvas. Um, the due date for that should be just maybe about a half an hour or so after our normal lecture would meet, so our normal lecture 12. Thank you very much. See you soon. Let me know what you think. Office hours tomorrow. Okay, bye.